Hi friends! So in our previous lesson, we kicked this series off by creating a simple shell code loader. Now, as I mentioned then, in many ways that payload just served as our baseline. It was incredibly simple, with many obvious issues, but really its purpose was to provide us with an appropriate departure point from which to build off of. Now, one of the most obvious of these issues is of course that we hard-coded our shellcode. Now, there are a few issues with this, mostly related to bad OPSEC, but for now, let's really just place emphasis on two of them. First, we're including some shellcode generated from MSA Venom, which we can be pretty sure is already signatured by all major antivirus and EDR solutions. So since we're placing it in a format that will be written to disk, we are ensuring it will be subjugated to static analysis, i.e. signature detection. Now we could keep the payload hard-coded and still foil static analysis if we were able to properly obfuscate our code. However, another path would be to simply not subjugate it to static analysis at all by injecting and executing our shellcode directly from memory. But the second, almost more, at least in my mind, important reason we don't want to hard our shellcode is that it removes any level of flexibility. When we statically compile our shellcode, it means that it's quote unquote locked in. Once it's on the target system, we have no ability to make any changes. Now imagine you spent all the effort sneaking a payload onto a victim system and then let's say the IP you planned on using for your handler got burnt and you need to use a new one. Well, if your shellcode was hard coded, then in that situation... <laughs> Your only option would be to start right at the beginning. You'd have to compile a new payload and sneak it back onto the target system, and God forbid you'd need to make any changes again because, well... Ah, oh, shit. Here we go again. And so in this lesson, we'll learn an alternate approach. Instead of hard coding our shellcode, we'll host it remotely on a web server. And then in our code, we'll just use a simple .NET class to download our shellcode from the web server. Following that, we'll perform the exact same actions as we did before, that is to say we'll allocate memory, inject the shellcode into memory, and then execute the shellcode from memory. So since the shellcode itself will now never touch disk, we're no longer subjugating it to static analysis, thereby decreasing the probability of getting caught. Now of course dynamic analysis is a whole different story, and we'll get to strategies on how to deal with that in the future. What's more? Now that our shellcode is hosted on a web server that's fully under our control, if for whatever reason we needed to make any change to the payload, we can do so at will. One other major weakness of our shellcode loader you may or may not have noticed is that when it runs, it'll open a terminal window, which it actually depends on to maintain the connection. So not only does this mean our target might immediately become aware of our presence since a random terminal window just popped up, but even if they don't, and they just mindlessly close the window, well then we lose our connection. Look, you wanna be elite? You gotta do a righteous hack. So suffice to say, coding our payload to be dependent on a visible console window would not qualify as a righteous hack. And so then in addition to learning how to remotely host our payload, we'll also learn how to deal with this. Now just a tiny bit of housekeeping before we get going. First off, you can find this lesson's code right at the top of the description. Second, since we already covered most of the code in depth in our previous lesson, I won't be repeating it here. We'll only cover the code related to the changes we're making. Now, if you didn't catch that lesson and would like to understand the entirety of the code, I encourage you to watch that lesson first, link right at the top of the description. And that's it, friends. So let's do this. So first, let's just dip into some of our new boilerplate code. Here right at the top, you can see we have one additional namespace we are using, and we'll use that in order to download our shellcode from the web server. And then inside of our class here, there are two additional pinvoke signatures we use to import functions that we'll use to hide the console window. And then in service of that same goal, here's our last little line of boilerplate where we declare a named constant swhide. Though it's not strictly required, we're declaring it in service of creating clean code. Now something to maybe just mention here, 
just a seed I want to plant so you can think about it regarding clean code. Clean code is obviously a paradigm to ensure that other people, as well as future versions of ourselves, can understand what we've written. Now, of course, here we're learning about payloads. And so it makes a lot of sense to adhere to these principles from a pedagogical point of view. But of course, as you grow and continue to evolve, also keep in mind that there might come a time where you're no longer creating payloads for learning, but for actually using as part of Red Team operations. In that case, were your custom payload to be discovered, your goal would kind of flip on its head. What I mean is you'd want a blue teamer to sweat as much as possible trying to figure out what this code is doing. So in that case, in addition to a variety of potential obfuscation techniques, we'd focus on writing what we might term dirty code. <laughs> Now the best way to learn how to write dirty code is to learn how to create clean code. But just something I wanted to leave you with, something you can maybe think about, is that creating the least intelligible code can become an art in and of itself. Okay, so now as we step into our main function, this is where the actual changes occur. We encounter two lines of code which will immediately serve to hide our console window. Now to do so we essentially need two things. First is the handle representing the console window. And second is simply the constant zero, which we of course already declared right above with our named constant sw underscore hide. So then the first order of business is getting our handle. And we do this by invoking the function get console window. From the official documentation, Get console window retrieves the window handle used by the console associated with the calling process. And so here in our first line, we call the function and assign its value to the variable called handle. And now that we have both parameters required by our function show window, we simply invoke it. So we pass to it the handle representing the window. And then after that, we also pass our named constant, which of course is just a placeholder for zero. Zero simply means hide the window. Okay. And so that's it for dealing with our conspicuous window issue. So now let's move on to the implementation of our remotely hosted payload. So first thing is we create two variables. First is the string payload URL. And we can see here that we specify the name and location of our payload on the web server. Now, just in general, if you wanna get super serial about these things, it would be better to specify FQDN here and leverage something like CDN or domain fronting, which in general would just raise less red flags. But for now, I'm not going to be too concerned with that. I just wanted you to be aware of it. Below that, we declare an unassigned byte array called shellcode, which will be the container of our shellcode post download. And so here we get to our new shellcode implementation. At the top, we're initializing an instance of the web client class, which is part of the .NET system.NET namespace we added earlier to our code right at the top. And we're implementing a using statement in this case, just to help ensure that client, i.e. our web client object, is properly disposed of after the scope ends. This is just good practice for managing resources efficiently. We can see here that we're using the download string method of our web client object and passing the string we declared above as the sole parameter. And then we're assigning the return value, which will be a base64 encoded string, i.e. our encoded shellcode, to this new variable called payload base64. And then finally here, we use the convert from base64 string method from the system namespace to decode payload base64 and assign it to the byte array that we created above. So you can probably read between the lines here, but please take note that we are sending the method a string payload base64 and then assigning the return value to a byte array. And that's because the method itself will perform the cast and return a byte array from us after we've sent it a string as the sole parameter. It's worth mentioning that we implement this base64 encoding not really as any form of obfuscation. It's really way too obvious for that. Rather, it's simply to ensure graceful handling of our binary data as it's transported over the network. And so that's it. At this point, we're exactly where we were before, i.e. we have our shellcode in a byte array called shellcode. So if you missed out on the previous lesson and would like to understand the rest of the code in more detail, link right at the top of the description. But for now, let's go ahead and test our new payload.
Okay, before we actually get to testing our code, I just want to mention that since we are now implementing base64 encoding, there are actually a few things we do want to take careful note of in terms of data types. It's good to be aware of this because if you mess it up, it won't work. Now, as always, we simply start by generating our shellcode using MSA Venom. Here, I'll run the exact same command as we did in the previous lesson. So now we have our output in shellcode.txt and you might think, okay, great, let's just go Go ahead and use the conveniently built-in application Base64 to encode it and Bob's your uncle. But let's quickly cat out the contents to see what we just generated and see what the actual issue with that is. You can see here in this text file there is actually a lot of boilerplate that we don't want. And that's because in our command when we specify C sharp, MSA Venom is literally going to produce a line of code and it's in effect telling us hey just copy and paste this line directly into your C sharp code. And so actually we don't want that. We don't want this boilerplate and we don't want these commas either. Instead what we really want is simply the raw shellcode in its binary form. And so while we're looking at it here, I just want you to take note that it starts with FC and it ends with D5. Let's just keep that in mind. And so I'm going to go ahead and delete shellcode.txt. And now let's run the MSA Venom command again, but instead of saying C sharp, let's change the output format to raw. Okay, great, so you can see that we have a shellcode.txt again. So let's cat it out again and see if indeed it starts with FC and it ends with D5 and... Compute says no. So why are we getting this gibberish right now? Well, fret not, nothing went wrong. This is actually to be expected. And it's because we are now trying to look at the contents using cat. But the issue is that cat is trying to interpret this raw binary data as if it were text, which it's not meant to be. So instead, we should use something like XXD, or I'm going to use Hexdump capital C, and this will allow us to look at the actual raw binary data. And we can see it right here, and we can see that indeed it starts with FC, and right down here it ends with D5. Great, so now we're ready to simply convert this to Base64 and save it as payload.txt, which we saw is the name of the file our payload will be expecting. And just as a quick sanity check, let's decode our new text and pipe it back through Hexdump. And indeed, we can see our payload is good to go. And so here in the same directory as payload.txt, I will simply spin up a Python web server. And now one final thing on our Kali machine, let's quickly get a handler going. And so we have our handler listening and we also have our Python server in the same directory as payload.txt, which contains our base64 encoded raw binary shellcode. And so we can switch over to our Windows Victim VM. Here we are in the same directory as our new C Sharp payload. And so I'm simply going to run the .NET compiler CSC. And we can see here that we successfully compiled our code into a binary called remote.exe. And so now let's run our binary, but I don't want to do so from terminal. So rather let's go ahead and double click on it in the GUI. And we can see here that yes, indeed, our console window immediately closed. And now back on our Kali machine, we can see that indeed we have our connection. Big success. All right, friends, so that's it. I think this already represents a major leap in the evolution of our payload. We learned how to hide our console window. We learned how to remotely host and then download our payload. And we learned some important things around data types, binary versus strings, and base64 encoding and decoding, etc. This is all critical foundational knowledge for working with payloads, loaders, rats, etc. And so if this is the path you're keen on walking, this will all serve you very well. And so as I mentioned on a post last week, I recently started two new part-time jobs both are really amazing. In the one, I'm learning a lot about reversing and exploit development. And the other one is a deep dive into threat hunting and C2 customization. I'll share more details when it becomes appropriate. They're both still very fresh. I just wanted to bring it up so that you understand and forgive my tardiness in terms of my publishing output. 
So for now, I want you to know that I am fully committed to staying with this one specific course and pushing it as far as we can. I don't quite know where that is yet, but I am confident that when we're done, this will be the most comprehensive free course on C-sharp payloads you can find online. So we still have some ways to go. So in the next two lessons, I am not really sure what the order will be yet. I'm still figuring out what makes most sense, but we're going to implement more complex multi-staging and we'll also implement living off the land techniques to further evolve our payload. Now, if you wanted to be sure to not miss it, please consider subscribing and hitting that sneaky little notification bell. And if not, well, no worries. Until next time. Peace out.